everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome back to our Lunch and Learn. Uh, today we have a really special guest. Oh, before I do that, I always forget. Um, my name is Jessica Nunez. I'm the Youth Program Manager at the NERC Museum of Art. And today we're joined by Amy Simon Hopwood, who is our Associate Curator of Decorative Arts here at the museum. And she covers everything from jewelry, textiles, toys, works on paper, glass, furniture, and our amazing Valentine House. Um, she joined, uh, she became the associate curator in January 2018. And today I'm inspired by the topic. Uh, we're gonna be learning about clothing in art. So I'm wearing a kimono. Uh, don't forget to submit your questions using the Q&A feature, either at the bottom or at the top. All right, I'm gonna pass it to Amy. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Newark Museum of Art virtually. And I wanna thank Jessica and the Learning and Engagement team for this opportunity to look at the collections from all of our homes. So today we um, will look at clothing and art and see what clues the garments, the accessories, and um, the posture of the people sitting in the the people in the artwork reveal both about the artists, the people in the image, and their cultures. And so we'll talk about what questions can we ask as we look at art in the museum, as well as since so many of us are uh, cooped up in our homes, what sort of questions can you ask of the images in the art around you at your home and the images? And so um, here we can go to the next, the next slide, please. What are, what does the clothing in art say about age, uh, class, gender, behavior, expectations of beauty, um, as well as what is the clothing of that exact time period and also how much input do the people shown have? How much, what is the artist trying to say? Are they showing things from reality? Are they making things up? Um, so we'll, we'll talk about all of these and because so many of us are used to taking selfies now, um, whether we're taking our own images or taking images obviously of our friends and family, and you often hear people say, not now, I'm not ready, um, don't take my picture please. Uh, and so what are the reasons behind that? Is it that your hair and makeup, you're not wearing the clothes, it's all about how do you want to be presented? So if you do want to take a selfie or be in someone else's picture, what are you thinking about um, in the way that you want to be presented? And so let's plunge into the next slide and look at some of the diverse art in the museum's collections and see what questions we can ask about the clothing and the artwork. So next slide, oh, there we go. So the first two pictures I selected, these are both portraits in the collection and portraits are interesting because um, there's a lot of choice, obviously. The person shown either paid for it or someone else paid on their behalf. Um, but the idea that they are definitely choosing how they want to be shown and working with the artist. So we have two portraits of two women from about 100 years apart, um, but they both are working within their culture and time period about ways to be shown. So the woman on the left, um, Free Love Only, from about 1765, she is covered and wrapped in silk. Uh, her dress is silk and um, she's leaning on an orange swath of silk. She's got a silk kind of drapery and silk. We don't, un con can't conceive of it today because fabric was so much more expensive than um, in the 18th and early 19th century than it was today. So by wrapping herself literally in silk and having expensive handmade lace um, trims at her sleeve and her neckline, as well as the silk ribbon holding her jewelry and that not functional but ornamental little headpiece. All of these are ways that she was saying, I am wealthy, I'm the wife of a wealthy merchant, and she's um, being posed in the position that nobility and many other portraits use. So she's demonstrating that she knows her culture's idea of the proper posture and ideas of how the culture expected women to present themselves. Um, she, some of the garments um, and accessories she may have borrowed from the artists and some she may have brought in herself. And the unknown woman on the right, 
um, from uh, Bamako, Mali. She is also working with a photographer who is very well known, and she most likely wore her own dress in, which is all, lots of detailed uh, tailoring and stitching in this printed cotton, as well as her gold bracelets and earrings and the variety of necklaces she's wearing. And that's either a glazed cotton or possibly a silk head wrap. So she again is demonstrating her family and her, her, her family's wealth, her personal style, her knowledge of her community's expectations. And she may have worked with the artist to choose the backdrop or the chair and her pose. But again, both of them are actively engaged in presenting themselves. Next slide, please. This might take a minute. Some of the files are rather large. So anyway, we're asking about the fabric and if um, you're able to change the slide. There we go. So previously we were talking about the fabrics and the clothing and the posture. And these three images, um, the one on the left, a tintype of an unidentified African-American woman is also, she went to the photographer's studio and chose to have her portrait made. The other two images, the artists are really creating a story about types rather than individuals, but I wanted to draw your attention to all three women's bodices. Um, the woman in the tintype on the left is in a light colored, looks like a uh, printed bodice, and then we have the one in the sculpture in the center and the woman on the right. And bodices were fitted, cut from many pieces of fabric and fitted to fit the shape of the corset that women wore underneath. And then they would have a separate skirt, which would also have undergarments to hold up the structure. And so what, uh, like the fabric was much more expensive, the fit of a garment and the fabric was so much more important in the 19th century than it is today, because if you couldn't afford a uh, seamstress or a dressmaker, or you didn't have the sewing skills, your clothing wouldn't fit the expectations. And so people could tell right away and also the quality of the fabric. So the grouping in the center, kind of an idealized uh, American family, he's taking the oath. So they're um, supporting the Union cause in the Civil War, um, the soldiers in his uniform, the woman you can see her bodice and skirt, their son is in a uh, fashionable, kind of his best clothing, a nice kind of sailor top and pants and shoes, whereas the young African-American boy, who is definitely a type, not an individual, is wearing very artfully tattered clothing. Um, so fitting kind of social expectations from the 1860s of, of how you would portray an African-American boy, he's shoeless. And so if you look at both how the garments are constructed the fabric and and how the individual the person not the individual is shown you start to pull these out and I just wanted to bring your attention to the woman on the right because she's wearing a fashionable uh, bodice type and sleeves of the 1860s but it's in darker fabric possibly a cotton or wool blend much sturdier easier to clean she has an apron to protect it and um, her skirt which is not the big wide fashionable hoop skirts if you think of little women and the varying degrees of hoop skirts in that film recently um, but so not practical to our eyes, but she's practically dressed for her housework. And yet um, the artist has shown her with a, a colorful hat, head wrap, which alludes to her cultural heritage um, and the suggestion of the possibility of an individual. So I could go on for hours, but if we can go to the next slide, please. Again, all of these, I could spend an hour on any one of these images, but I just want to give you the sense of the questions you can ask when you're looking at things. So this idea of individual versus type, we have a platter here on the 1830s with this print from the landing of Columbus. And I know it's a little hard to see, but the two um, Native American figures who are looking behind the tree at the arrival of Columbus, they reveal much more. You can ask, you know, what did the artists or um, the Europeans and the European Americans, uh, middle class Americans, what were their expectations of Native Americans? Because the feather headdresses and the um, kind of loosely draped fabric and animal hide garments have very little to do with what the Taino Indians of the Caribbean would have worn when Columbus arrived. But it's, you can ask, what are the expectations or the, the information and the knowledge that the um, artist or designer had, which far surpasses the reality of what um, the Taino Indians would have worn. 
at that point in time. And on the right, we can also ask, you know, what is the artist's intention and, and what is the artist's background and knowledge and their artistic interests? Uh, here we have Jeffrey Gibson's Come Alive, I Feel Love, and he's really building upon his Cherokee and Choctaw heritage, as well as his interest in kind of pan Native American cultural heritage and abstract art, pop culture, and he's really building upon um, and celebrating the powwow culture of the Native American um, various uh, communities. And so he's constructed, if you look at his ankles, as well as at his waist and shoulders and the headdress are all made of um, rolled up jingles made of the tops of um, from snuff cans. And so alluding to the jingle dresses worn by a Native American woman, but here you have an abstracted figure, um, kind of gender neutral, individual neutral, but abstracted and there's um, arrowheads and turquoise and minerals and all these elements from his cultural heritage and his personal family and personal experience to create the essence of clothing. So we're not even really looking at clothing here, but you can ask of this type of artwork, well, what what is he alluding to in actual clothing and how is, is this artist in particular translating that for the artwork. Okay, next slide, please. And, um, and so here again, we have um, two images, two uh, works of art showing similar styles of garment from different time periods and very different expectations. Yinka Shanabara on the left is really physically putting his abstracted figure, anonymous mannequin on a tightrope, straddling cultures. And we can ask, well, what does the garment, um, the style of the garment and the fabric have to say about that? And so it's a stylized kind of 1890s, late 19th century. Again, the fitted dress, I keep talking about the fitted bodice, um, has a high neck and those puffed sleeves that have shown up throughout style history, but um, often now in this, at our current time, we think of the late 19th century, but also what's going on with the fabric. This is a wax resist print and Shona Barra is really talking about all sorts of cultural changes of the same fabric over time and across place and community. So the Dutch um, originally learned about wax resist in their Indonesian and Javanese colonies and then started selling wax resist prints um, in, their, in various African um, communities and colonies at the time um, as trade goods. But then in Nigeria over time, and especially since independence, um, the Nigerian designers and textile designers have made it their own and created these wonderful, vibrant um, prints based on the same cotton and wax resist printing. And so, Shonabara is talking about balancing, I have to use my hands here and there. Um, he's talking about all this blend of culture. So you can start with the fabric or start with the design of the garment and start to ask, well, what's the history of the, the, the process or what's the history of the style and how does that fit in both historically and in the artist's perspective. And on the right, we have uh, Miss Alice Brisbane Thursday. Her portrait was painted um, 1897 or 98, as you can see. So she has very large um, sleeves that were incredibly fashionable in the late in the 1890s. Um, and it's made of all sorts of inset laces and um, silks and she has frills and not a practical dress. Um, but yet, if we look at her pose where she looks like she's practically leaping out of that chair with her arms akimbo, she's not a demure young miss. She's, she's got a mind of her own. And it's alluding to the whole rise of what we call the new woman in the 1890s, where there were, at least in certain communities, the expectation that women should be could be educated, um, could go to college, could play some limited sports, whether basketball, very mild version, or lawn tennis, or ride a bicycle. And so the clues, even though it's a, quite a feminine with all the laces and frills, what we think of as feminine, um, though 
I could go off on a side tangent about that. So, but for now in the 1890s, she's wearing this, but you see that glimpse of a high neck white blouse and peeking through and, and the fact that her bodice is a bit more open to reveal, it suggests men's wear with men's ja suit jackets and men's um, button down shirts. And so uh, the new woman in the 1890s would wear shirt waist, what we think of as blouses and jackets. So. Uh, Miss Thursby is wearing this as well as um, factory workers in the shirtwaist factory so that um, and department store clerks would wear shirtwaists and um, menswear jackets much less elegant than Miss Thursby's but they were all united in this kind of cultural shift and uh, next slide please. So and again so I'm only giving you an overview here again is is this idea of change across cultures and on the right kind of flipping uh, which way you look first we have a kimono on a on a kimono stand so you can really see how kimono is constructed of flat panels of fabric the embroidery and some of the woven decoration runs all across it and it is not cut from small bits of pieced fabric that are stitched to conform to the body in fact as you can see in this central image the kimono is wrapped around Round, tied with the obi or the sash worn under under kimono so it's all draped which was completely new to westerners in the late 19th century and so the woodblock print shows a uh, woman very fashionable knows how to wear her kimono and how to move and behave and she's obviously adjusting her headdress and looking in a mirror and those the patterns, as you can see, are wrapped around her body as opposed to the dressing gown from about 1880 to 83 that was made in Japan for the European market. And those embroidered flowers are running up the center front opening of the garment and around the cuff and around the collar. So the expect, that's what Westerners would have been in Europe and America and wherever Western dress was worn would have assumed and you can't quite see it but the the dressing gown or robe is cut to fit over a, bu a bustle it just would sag if you weren't wearing the proper undergarments so we could go on for a long time about asking about why on earth what does it say about that culture that and that time period that you would wear a, a dressing gown something for relaxation but still be wearing undergarments and so it's this vague area that between public and private um, and if you think about it even today people have some you know you have your fancy pajamas or for semi-public presentation so anyway just all of these are ways to questions to ask about the cut and the um, fabric and the decoration and how it's worn and what it's worn with okay next slide please so come up but um so again it's like as i talked about earlier with the the bodices and they're made of many pieces of fabric cut and shaped and pieced together what you see here today um in front of you are two images where the artists are showing people in what's very familiar to us now are t-shirts um, they're unstructured. I mean, they have a, they're a tube of fabric with a seam to sew the arms in, um, possibly some shaping. Um, and then the men on the left are working in a factory here in Newark at the Ronson Art Metal Factory, and they're wearing various variations on work clothing. They all have work pants on, um, just as the people on the quilt do. But you have an under a sleeveless undershirt. Behind him is a man in a blue, uh, probably cotton work shirt, button down still with a collar. And then the man on the right in a hot foundry has just completely removed his shirt. But up until the mm, roughly, very roughly, uh, mid 20th century, only people who are in working, hard labor, physical working environments would be seen in public in clothing like this. But by the mid 20th century children, and then when you think 1960s, especially in 50s, um, young adults would start to wear t-shirts as outerwear. Um, but it really, you can start to ask, well, what do these clothes reveal about ideas of class and different occupations, um, as well as the growing sense of 
more slightly gender neutral clothing because the couple, this is the, on the quilt, the artist took a photograph of his friend and his friend's sister-in-law and then quilted the image right over the other, uh, the background quilt. And so by the 1990s and up till today, this idea that you, men and women could wear the same t-shirt or you could also wear a high end designer t-shirt that was cut and fitted and not quite as practical but this idea of comfort ease of fit affordable um and just really relaxation and comfort is much more our priority than what we saw in some of the previous images uh, this couple on the quilt are also wearing blue jeans and so in both cases, um, the artist is really documenting people they knew um, in clothing that they were familiar with. I'm thinking of all of you sitting in your uh, homes today. I would imagine that many of you are wearing t-shirts as well. And so think about you know, how comfortable they are, how easy they are to toss in the washer, um, that you can borrow someone else's t-shirt and you don't have to worry about fit as much. So, and I think we're almost to the, the last slide. And the next slide, please. And so I just wanted to end thinking of you, many of you possibly in, in t-shirts sitting at home, um, were not able to go outside and, and uh, go to large groups or any groups at all really. So I wanted to give you some artistic renditions of outdoor public events for, uh, to think about the future when we can go back. So both of these images are, you know, outdoor events and also kind of uh, public recreation and relaxation. And again, this idea of 20th century ideas. And so on the left, we have a side slide sideshow, not a slideshow, at Coney Island, and it's undated, but probably the 1930s, and you see the woman, the audience has their back to us, and they're all wearing variations of loose-fitting clothing. The woman in the center has a pink sleeveless top. Um, the children all have relatively loose fitting clothing, which was much more by the 20s and 30s, there was starting to be factory made mass produced clothing. And so loose fitting made from larger flat panels is much easier to make and more affordable. But the women in the show, some of them are wearing two piece swimsuits, which would have been incredibly risque and new in the 1930s. Um, and then on the right, in comparison, we have a beauty contest taken by the photographer Henry Clay Anderson and in, in his community in Greenville, Mississippi, about 1960. And these women in the um, beauty contest are wearing very fitted, structured, they even have some stays probably in them um, to create the shaping um, dresses that they're not at all um, for swimming, their bathing suits, they're not for getting wet in. And if you imagine they have longer skirts, they look like party dresses of the days. So, and the young women, uh, the girls watching them, you can get a sense of how social expectations and ideas of behavior and beauty are kind of embedded and learned in, in, in ongoing generations. But really looking at both of these images, you can ask what are these swimsuits or bathing suits made of? What are the people wearing and um, what are their expectations of, of physical exposure and recreation um, and all the other questions we talked about. And I'll leave it there because I'm very excited to have your questions. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, before we get any questions, as questions are sort of trickling in, uh, I wanna hear your thoughts on what did you think about today getting dressed for uh, our webinar? <laughs> right. Well, it's an interesting thing because everyone is, is, is seeing me. And I, um, after several weeks at home wearing lots of t-shirts and sweatshirts, I thought, you know, even though I'm, I'm broadcasting from my dining room, I am very happy to uh, be able to wear work clothing and think about presenting myself in a work mode. Okay, I was super inspired, I have to say. So I, I dug through my closet and I was like, yes, the kimono will do this conversation justice. Yeah. Uh, so thank you again so much for sharing. Uh, I have a few questions coming in. I did have a question on my own. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how clothing, uh, sometimes in early American portraiture, 
can explain relationships, like in a marriage or relationships of status? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question because I think the details of the clothing really show those relationships. So um, usually in the 18th century, the husband and wife might be wearing, you know, the gender roles were very strict. And so you could tell by the colors of the fabrics, um, what fabrics are shown. Um, you can see the difference in that relationship. And then um, the children are always shown, you know, childhood was a very distinct time period. It ended sooner than it does today. So boys, young boys, before they were potty trained or shown in skirts. Um, and sometimes when boys are shown in skirts, there's still details that you can tell about the cut of the garment that separates them from a uh, girl in a, the, of the same age in a dress. So there are all sorts of little clues and I'd be happy to do a whole conversation about that. Thank you. So I'm gonna get to some of the questions. Jennifer wants to know if pockets were built into dresses, some of the dresses you talked about. Um, in the 18th century, so the first picture that we saw um, with the 18th century portrait, her pockets were, they were separate objects and um, a big like long panel with a slit that you could stick your hand in. There were slits in the side of the skirts and you would tie that around your waist. So that's often why there's the nursery rhyme, Lucy Lockett has lost her pocket because in the 20th century blue jeans that we saw in the picture, you would not lose your pocket because they're stitched in, they're structurally attached. Um, but in the 18th century, you could physically lose your pocket just like Lucy did. Wow, I had no, I had no idea. Uh, I have a few other questions here. Um, Mary would like to know, um, in the Jeffrey Gibson piece, why did he use snuff box tops in the work? Some of the materials. Um, I think because that's often artists and and different communities use things that are around them, and this is something I have to say that. Um, Native American clothing is not my strength. And so that's one thing I, I did a little bit of research for the, and just looked at the artifact and that's what it is. But I would want to go back and do some research and ask questions about, is that something that is traditionally used by the Native American communities when they make their jingles or did they also, um, were there other materials or were those jingle beads um, purchased at a, um, at a trading post or a store. So I would want to go back and do more research, but it's a great question. I have another one that just got texted to me. So I'm, I apologize if I'm, if I'm reading off my phone here. It says, hi, Amy. I always imagined that enslaved woman's dress in the Homer picture was a hand-me-down from her mistress or owner. Is, could that be a possibility? Yes, it could. And this is where this was very hard for me because I could have spent so much time on each picture. Um, in almost all in, um, photographs, unless you have like a document by the artist or the sitter to explain it, yes. It, in the Winslow Homer, it because she's wearing a, a fashionably cut sleeve, it could have been a hand-me-down and there was a, a large second-hand market of clothing. Um, as well. So we don't know. And that is a really great point because I gave you a speedy overview of what it could be, but really to be thorough, you would want to cover all those possibilities um, as opposed to just saying that she had it made or she bought it for that particular image. So that's a great question to think about these details. So we have a lovely comment about Mrs. Thursby uh, mm -hmm. saying how she looks like a very strong character. Um, and Amy, could you kind of elaborate on what, since we're not physically at the museum, mm -hmm. what that new woman, that, that turn uh, in the gallery is for everyone at home? Uh, yes, so that's a, the gallery um, of all sorts of um, images uh, painted by or of women in the 1890s, turn of the century, and this idea that there was a definite cultural shift, not for everyone, um, but for the, you know, relatively um, a large number of people because there are a lot of, of paintings. So we have several paintings 
of women who have that independence. Uh, there's an image of a woman painting. We have a uh, image of a woman who is a newspaper editor. So she's shown in her living room turning to look back at the artist or the viewer uh, reading her newspaper in a position that at that time would have only you would only have seen a man in that position and so for her to be shown that way was definitely proclaiming her independence and kind of forward thinking in that same vein someone else is asking us um when was the first time or uh, a roundabout uh, estimate of when women start wearing pants in paintings or in portraits Right, that's a great question. So there is a history of very working class women wearing pants in the 19th century. There are photographs of mine workers in England, women wearing pants, but it was, it was, that, it was work clothing. If they wore them home and wore them in their home or to the store, they would have, um, there were places where it was illegal, but they would have definitely gotten a lot of social, uh, uh, what's the word? They it would not have been approved of. But women wearing pants um, in paintings and portraits, you start to see in the 19 teens and 20s, there was a huge cultural shift with the First World War changing roles and many more women um, did jobs that uh, to replace the men who were fighting. And so by the 1920s, there had been such social upheaval that you started to have designers um, selling of lounge pants and, and resort wear clothing, and then it's, it, it filtered into the community. So you see that in Hollywood films in the 20s and 30s. So like the two-piece swimsuit we saw, you would start to see women wearing pants. But at first, it was the most daring women who had whatever sort of independence that they could get away with disturbing the Right, I think, I, think, I think right now, we often don't think about uh, clothing as a as a form of rebellion or as a form of activism. And I think in throughout many decades, we see that uh, whether it was the bathing suit, the pants, lowering the hemlines, not wearing a corset. Right. Um, so I think it just kind of evolves over time. I think I have one more question about Mrs. Thursby. Mm -hmm. Is she wearing a necklace? Um, I would have to look at the picture. I don't have it right in front of me. She, I think she's wearing a long, like a long chain. Um, and that might be, she might have her glasses on it. Um, but it's, it, whatever it is, it is uh, fashionable at the time. So yeah, it's about the eighth slide in. There we go. This is where I don't have every single image memorized. But yeah, she's wearing that white thing around her, I think is a long, um, long, narrow necklace, which was fashionable at the time, yes. So you can see it kind of is reflective. Um, it was just a, a, a popular style of a metalwork chain. Sometimes they would have little tiny jewels in them. If, if she was old enough to be wearing reading glasses, it might, she might carry them that way. Um, but that is a, a necklace. Thank you, Amy. Um, I have a question from Kathy. She wants to know, was the westernized kimono more of a costume for particular occasions or was it westernized fashion trend of the time worn by women throughout the day? Uh, that's a great question. So usually uh, the kimonos um, were worn as um, dressing gowns or kind of private loungewear. So it was very much worn for a specific time and usually in private or only in your, with your closest friends. Um, and they were not worn the way a Japanese woman, they were not worn as originally intended. Um, the intel sometime into the 20th century, most American or European women wouldn't understand the proper way to wear it. Um, and also the expectation that it was relaxing. You could wear it without your corset when people were wearing corsets. So kind of think about it as loungewear. Okay, thank you. Let me see here. I don't want to skip anyone's questions or greetings. Laisa says hello. She just wants to say hi. And uh, she really enjoys Yinka Shinibara's work and is super fascinated by how he explores globalization through clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you touched upon that, talk, talking a little bit about um, the fabric. Could you elaborate a tiny bit more about the fabric and how he's impacted by globalization in his art? 
Um, sure. So the fabric itself, um, the what we think of as batik and wax resist, where you would you know kind of paint wax on it and dip dip the fabric in the dye and then pull it out, and when you remove the wax, it has not been dyed, and you can do that with um, incredible variations and layering. And so the Dutch had uh, colonies in um, in Indonesia and um, Java, and I'm, I. Pardon me if I'm getting the specific details wrong, but that they the Dutch learned of these patterns and um, and processes and took them back and then started creating them to sell as trade goods in Africa. So you have three or four hundred years of this um, habit, and then um, or not habit, but history and translation across communities. And then, as I said. Um, the African designers, particularly in Nigeria, have really made the fabric their own. So using the same procedures, um, but creating patterns that speak to their own um, cultural heritage and community and, and colorways. And so I think Shona Barr really is thinking about having grown up moving back and forth between cultures and communities. Um, really spends a lot of time using fabric on his mannequins. We have a wonderful installation for those of people know party time, which is in the Ballantine House dining room, a whole group of these anonymous um, dressed figures wearing the wax resist fabric. So this idea of who belongs where and what setting, um, who, how how the fabric really takes this idea of straddling cultures and community and even change over time. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Catherine wants to know, she's referring to the, her first, to the very first slide that we had up, the pairing of the women, uh, the painting and the photograph. They're both super striking, um, both in not just their clothing, but also their pose. Like yeah. clothing styles that move across cultures often through colonization, do, would, do you think the pose also functions this way? Yes, I think so. Um, because obviously if, if the colonizing country, the dominant culture, um, because if you think about the portrait on the left um, with the silk, America was still a colony. Um, so they, they're taking their clues um, from the artwork coming from the colonizing co countries. So uh, Free Love Only is sitting in a position that she would have seen in prints from coming from England, whether it was nobility or wealthy women. And again, uh, Seydou Keita, who worked in Mali, um, became known across Africa and many uh, countries there for his, his uh, photographs and he was known for really setting the person very close to the backdrop to create this kind of dynamic like she becomes part of the the background and it all right. works together um, but he he was knowledgeable about photographic traditions and poses so yes both of them they're not working in isolation they're working as part of the larger artistic community Okay, thank you. Now, beside getting dressed, I think a lot of us also put thought into our accessories, right? Whether yes. it's our, mm -hmm. our earrings, our watch, bracelet, a necklace, I see you have a beautiful necklace on. So a few people have questions about the role of jewelry and the evolution of jewelry and shoes. Ah, well, I think with anything, any clothing, any textile, anything you have, like the stuff behind me, like all objects are a way of showing both the individual personality as well as the cultural expectation of what's the, the right thing, the right style. And also jewelry, especially, but even shoes are a great marker of status. You think um, jewelry is portable. Um, if you if you can afford gold or silver or, or jewels, it's a way of, of carrying your family's wealth, both if you wear it in a portrait or artwork, it's a way of proclaiming your personal and your family wealth. It's also a way of, if you need to, um, either if you're nomadic or if you need to move in a hurry, you can carry your wealth with you. And then obviously, um, you can also show your knowledge of current fashions and styles by with jewelry. And the same can be said for shoes, though. Um, 
they're obviously much more functional except for high-end either designer shoes or party shoes or that's a way of talking about status because if you can afford to go to a party where your feet are killing you by the end of the night it says something about where you fit in society <laughs> also you think about the uh chinese women's bound feet was definitely a way of saying i'm so wealthy that i can't and don't need to stand up or do any physical labor well, so, okay so. All right, let's see. I, I still have a few more questions for you, Amy. Uh, a comment. Um, uh, it says, I think it's interesting, different types of construction that were all closely tied to the way fabric is made. Mm -hmm. I think I want to link this to um, Mrs. Valentine, the Valentine house. I know mm -hmm. she had a seamstress. And in 1885, 1895, we don't see Velcro. We don't see zippers. Right. Um, how was she getting into those beautiful gowns? Well, all those beautiful gowns you think mrs thursby uh you had a mate you had not only did you have the money to have a good seamstress or mrs valentine also went to paris and bought worth gowns we have a few in the collection i hope someday we can show them um so you had the money the, uh, mrs valentine in particular had the money to afford the the dress the fabric uh all the accessories and jewelry and everything went went with it and she also had a maid um, because you really needed a maid to help you get in or out of it or you know I referred to little women it's on my mind or you had lots of sisters um, but but you needed assistance to get into that clothing all right uh, this is our very last question uh, Mary says when looking at portraits of the 19th century and earlier artistic techniques depict the sheen and luxury of fabrics and the details of lace are super noteworthy how did the evolution of just getting more detailed um, heighten the importance of fabric during this time, like being able to represent them? Um, well, I think especially before photography, art was all about showing details because it was prints, paintings, it was a way of being very precise and showing all of that. I think with the rise of photography, which was first a tool for kind of taking notes for um, artists, but once you had photography, then painting started, there was more of an interest in the abstraction. Now, obviously there were other things going on. It wasn't just because of photography, um, but you had, had impressionism and then you started to have, um, early 20th century abstraction and late 20th century abstraction. And so the, by then in those paintings, the details aren't so important. It's more the mood if you can even recognize it. But I think in the 18th and 19th century, it was, you know, you wanted to show off those details, especially if you were paying for a portrait. Um, but even in other types of painting, the details were important. All right. And we're gonna finish with a comment. Um, so many wealthy, wealthy women, um, much like Downton Abbey, and I know I'm a fan of the show, right. had maids to help them with their dresses. So just, just think about time periods and think of not the accessibility of fabrics and globalization um, have a huge impact on what we wear, even designers and what we wear now, right? Right, so right. Well, it's thank you again, Amy. Oh, very welcome, and I look forward to talking again. Thanks so much, Jessica. Thank you. Bye. So everyone, bye. Don't forget, don't forget to join us next week. We have artist Saya Wolfock, and she will be discussing a little bit about her art practice and how the museum's collection speaks to her work. Uh, she's a New York-based artist who uses science fiction and fantasy to reimagine the world in multiple dimensions. So I'm really excited about next week. Don't forget to follow us on social media, like and share. Uh, and have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.